Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, beloved family, it is truly an honor to stand here today and deliver this lecture. I take great pride in the recognition bestowed on us and great pride in the theory the prize recognizes, the theory of the strong nuclear force, quantum chromodynamics, or QCD. In my talk, I shall describe the turn of events that led to the discovery of asymptotic freedom, which in turn led to the formulation of QCD, the final element in the remarkably comprehensive theory of elementary particle physics, the so-called standard model uh, that we possess today. I'll then describe briefly the experimental tests of the theory and the implications of asymptotic freedom. I'll start in the early 60s at Berkeley where I started my graduate studies. Berkeley at that time was a period of experimental supremacy and theoretical impotence. The construction and utilization of, of particle accelerators was proceeding at full steam. New experimental discoveries and surprises appeared every few months. By contrast, there was hardly any theory to speak of, with only small islands of understanding here and there. Field theory was in disgrace. S-matrix theory was in full bloom. Symmetry was all the rage. Of the four forces observed in nature, only gravity and electromagnetism were well understood. The other two forces, the weak force responsible for radioactivity, and the strong nuclear force that operated within the nucleus were largely mysterious. Fermi had formulated a powerful and accurate field theory of beta decay which, though clearly deficient at high energy, was to serve as a framework for exploring the weak interactions for three decades. Yukawa had proposed a field theory to describe the nuclear force predicted the existence of heavy mesons, which were soon discovered. Quantum field theory originally developed to render Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism consistent with quantum mechanics seemed to be the natural tool to describe elementary particles. The application of quantum field theory had important early successes, notably in electrodynamics, where renormalization theory had eliminated the ubiquitous infinities that plagued calculations by expressing physical observables in terms of physical parameters. But by the 1950s, a, the suspicion of field theory had deepened to the point where a powerful dogma emerged. Field theory was fundamentally flawed, especially in its application to the strong interactions. At Berkeley, the strong force was the focus of experimental and theoretical activity, and it was regarded as especially difficult. The early attempts in the 1950s to construct field theories of the strong force were total failures. There were too many elementary particles. There was no clue to the dynamics and no way to calculate. In hindsight, this was not surprising since nature was cleverly hiding her secrets. The basic constituents of hadrons, hadrons are strongly interacting nuclear particles, were invisible. We now know that the basic constituents are quarks, but no one had ever, or ever will, see a quark, no matter how hard protons were smashed into protons. Furthermore, the color charges we now know are the sources of the color or chromodynamic fields, the analog of the electric charge, were equally invisible. The prevailing feeling at the time was that it would take a very long time to understand the nuclear force. Dyson famously asserted that the correct theory would not be found for a hundred years in 1960. He was only wrong by 87 years. Many thought that to understand the strong force would require revolutionary new ideas. For a young graduate student such as myself, this was clearly the biggest challenge. 
In the United States, the main reason for the abandonment of field theory was simply that one could not calculate. American physicists are pragmatists. Quantum field theory had not proved to be a useful tool with which to make contact with the explosion of experimental discovery. Instead, all hadrons appeared to be on an equal footing, leading my advisor, Jeff Chu, to propose the notion of nuclear democracy in which all hadrons, by then there were dozens and dozens, were equally elementary. Even more radical was his bootstrap theory in which field theory was to be replaced by S-matrix theory, a theory based on general principles, locality, causality, but with no fundamental dynamical principle. The basic idea was that there was a unique S-matrix. The S-matrix is the object that determines the probabilities of particle scattering experiments. There was a unique S-matrix that obeyed these principles, and this S-matrix could be determined without the unphysical demand of fundamental constituents or equations of motion that are inherent in field theory. In the Soviet Union, field theory was under even heavier attack for different reasons. Landau and collaborators in the late 50s explored the relation between the physical electric charge and the bare, so-called bare electric charge that is seen at infinitesimally small distances. The fact that the electric charge in QED depends on the distance at which it is measured is due to the phenomena of vacuum polarization. The vacuum, the ground state of a relativistic quantum mechanical system, should be thought of as a medium containing virtual electron-positron pairs. If a charge is inserted into this medium, it polarizes the vacuum, distorts it, and this will lead to the screening of the charge. Consequently, the charge seen at some distance r, e of r, will be smaller than the charge seen at its location, the bare charge. As r increases, there is more screening of the medium. Thus, E of R decreases with increasing R and correspondingly increases with decreasing R. The beta function, which is minus the logarithmic derivative of the charge with respect to distance, is thus positive. Lando and colleagues concluded on the basis of their approximations that this effect is so strong that the physical charge as measured at any finite distance would vanish no matter how big the bare charge was, the charge seen at infinitesimally small distances. This is the famous problem of zero charge, a startling result that implied for Landau that weak coupling electrodynamics is a theory which is fundamentally logically incomplete. In the case of QED, this is only an academic problem, since the trouble shows up only at enormously high energy. However, in the case of the strong force, the same phenomena was expected to occur, and the catastrophe would occur at low energy. And therefore, Landau decreed that we are driven to the conclusion that the Hamiltonian method for strong interactions is dead and must be buried, though of course with deserved honor. If dynamics was impossible, at least one could explore the patterns and symmetries of hadrons. The biggest advance of the early 60s was the discovery of an approximate symmetry of hadrons by Gelman and Neyman, and then the beginning of the understanding of spontaneously broken chiral symmetry. Nowadays, we realize that these symmetries are an accidental feature of QCD, which arise simply because a few quarks, the up, down, and strange quarks, are relatively light compared to the scale of the nuclear force. At the time, the symmetry was regarded as a profound feature of the strong force, and many attempts were made to extend the symmetry and make it serve as a springboard for a theory of hadrons. 
in retrospect, <clears throat> the most important uh, consequence of the symmetry was Gelman and Zweig's hypothesis of quarks. The fact was that nature looked as if hadrons were composed of either three kinds of quarks, as in the case of a proton, or quark-antiquark -quark in the case of a meson. These quarks, if one assumed that their masses were small enough, uh, could explain very qualitatively the patterns and symmetries of hadrons. Han and Nambu and Greenberg speculated that each quark comes in triplets, or as we whimsically say today, has three colors. Yet quarks had never been seen, even at energies ten times the threshold for their production. This was not at all analogous to the case of atoms, which are made of nuclei and electrons, or to nuclei, which are made of nucleons. When you hit an atom, out pops an electron, but if you hit a hadron, out pops another hadron, not a quark. The conclusion was that quarks were fictitious mathematical devices, and with this attitude one could ignore the apparently insoluble dynamical problems that arose if you tried to imagine that quarks really existed. Well, at Berkeley I worked on S-matrix theory, as was fashionable, but after graduating I went to Harvard where field theory uh, was more tolerated. This was the heyday of current algebra and the air was buzzing with marvelous results. I was very impressed by the fact that one could assume a certain structure of current commutators derive measurable results. I studied the less understood properties of the algebra of local current densities. These properties were model dependent, went beyond mere symmetry, but that was fine because they might contain dynamical information, not just global symmetry patterns. Furthermore, it was realized that one could check one's assumptions about the structure of local current algebra by deriving relations that could be tested in deep and elastic scattering, uh, lepton-hadron scattering experiments. In early 1968, Kurt Callan and I proposed a relation to test the then popular Sugawara model, a dynamical model of local currents in which the energy momentum tensor was expressed as a product of currents. Our goal was to test this hypothesis by deriving a testable relation uh, for deep and elastic electron proton scattering. In the fall of 1968, Bjorkane noted that this relation would suggest a greatly simplified behavior called scaling of deep and elastic scattering cross-sections. This prediction was shortly confirmed by the new experiments at SLAC, which were to play such a crucial role in elucidating the structure of hadrons. Shortly thereafter, Callan and I discovered that by measuring the ratio of the cross-section for the scattering of longitudinal or transverse polarized virtual photons, one could determine the nature of the spin of the constituents of the proton. We discovered that the answer depended crucially on the spin of the constituents. If the constituents had spin zero or one, then the transversely polarized cross-section would vanish, but if they had spin one-half, then the longitudinal cross-section would vanish, a very dramatic result. And the experiments at SLAC at Stanford quickly showed that the longitudinal cross-section was very small, evidence that the constituents of the proton had spin one-half, just like quarks. These deep and elastic ex scattering experiments had a profound impact on me. They clearly showed that the proton behaved when viewed over short times and at short distances as if it was made of point-like objects of spin one-half, just like quarks. In the spring of 1969, Llewellyn Smith and I analyzed the relations that followed for deep and elastic neutrino nucleon scattering using similar methods and derived a relation that measured the baryon no number of the charged constituents of the proton and the experiment soon indicated that the 
constituents of the proton had baryon number one-third. In other words, they looked again like quarks, three of which are required to make up a proton. I was then totally convinced of the reality of quarks. Quarks had to be more than just mnemonic devices for summarizing hadronic experiments, summarizing hadronic symmetries. They had to be physical, point-like constituents of the nucleon, at least when viewed at short distances. But how could that possibly be? Surely there had to be strong forces between the quarks that would, uh, so that they couldn't be extracted from the proton, and such strong forces would surely smear their point-like behavior. I soon realized that in, in field theory only a free, non-interacting theory could produce point-like behavior, and this became very clear to me in 1970 when I arrived at Princeton where my colleague Callan and Simoncic had rediscovered the renormalization group equations which they presented as a consequence of the breaking of scaling, of scale invariance. And their work made it abundantly clear that once one introduced interactions into any field theory, scaling as well as my beloved relations went down the tube. And yet the experiments indicated that scaling was true. But one could hardly turn off the interactions between the quarks or make them very weak since then one would expect hadrons to break up easily into their quark constituents. Why had no one ever observed free quarks? This paradox and the search for an explanation of scaling were to preoccupy me for the next few years. Much happened during the next few years. Ed Hooft's spectacular work on the renormalizability of Yang-Mills theory reintroduced non-abelian gauge theories for generalizations of Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism to the community. The electroweak theory, based on such non-abelian gauge theories of Glashow, Weinberg, and Salam, was revived. Wilson's development of the operator product expansion provided a tool that could be applied to the analysis of deep and elastic scattering. The callan zemancic equation simplified the renormalization group analysis, which was then applied to the operator product expansion. By the end of 1972, I had learned enough to tackle the problem of scaling head-on, and I decided quite deliberately to prove that local quantum field theory could not explain scaling, and thus was not an appropriate framework for the description of the strong force. Thus, deep and elastic scattering would finally settle the issue as to the validity of quantum field theory for the strong force. The plan of the attack was twofold. First, I would prove that ultraviolet stability, which we, the vanishing of the charge at short distances, which we later called asymptotic freedom, was necessary to explain scaling. If the charge were contrary to QED to decrease at short distances, one might explain how the strong interactions turn off in this regime and produce scaling. Indeed, one might suspect that this was the only way to get point-like behavior at short distances. By the spring of 1973, Callan and I had completed a proof that scaling, that scaling required asymptotic freedom. Non-abelian gauge theories were not included in our arguments since our methods broke down for those theories, but the discovery shortly after of asymptotic freedom made this omission irrelevant. The second part of the argument was to show that there were no asymptotically free theories. This was to be expected, after all, the paradigm of quantum field theory, quantum electrodynamics, was infrared stable, in other words, the effective charge grew larger at short distances and no one had ever constructed a theory in which the opposite occurred. Well, I set up the formalism to analyze the most general field theory, uh, again without Yang-Mills theories, which was not difficult since to investigate asymptotic freedom it suffices to study the behavior of the theory for weak coupling and I almost had a complete proof, but was stuck on my inability to prove an, a necessary inequality when I discussed this issue with Sidney Coleman, who was spending the semester at Princeton. 
and he came up with a missing ingredient, and we had a proof that there were no sensible field theory with almost arbitrary interactions could be asymptotically free. The one exception was non-abelian gauge theories. Well, Frank Wilczek started to work with me in the fall of 72. He had come to Princeton as a math student, but soon discovered that he was really interested in particle physics, switched to the physics department after taking my field theory course, and started to work with me. My way of dealing with students then and now was to involve them closely with my work and often to work with them directly, and this was certainly the case with Frank, who functioned more as a collaborator than a student from the very beginning. And I told him about my program to determine whether quantum field theory could account for scaling. We decided that we would calculate the beta function for Yang-Mills theory. This was the one line of, in my argument that was missing. Coleman, who was visiting Princeton, asked me at one point whether anyone had ever calculated the beta function for Yang-Mills theory. I told him that we were working on this. He expressed interest because he'd asked his student, Pollitzer, to generalize a mechanism he'd explored with Eric Weinberg, that of dynamical symmetry breaking of a, an abelian gauge theory to the non-abelian case. Indeed, Pollitzer went on with his own calculation of the beta function for Yang-Mills theory. The calculation proceeded slowly. I was involved in other parts of the program, and there were tough issues to resolve. We first tried to prove on very general grounds uh, that the theory couldn't be asymptotically free, but this didn't work, so we proceeded to simply calculate. Today, this calculation is regarded as very simple and even assigned as a homework problem in quantum field theory courses. But at the time, it was not so easy. The theory was new. Nobody had done such calculations before. This change in attitude is the analog in theoretical physics of the familiar phenomena in experimental physics whereby yesterday's great discoveries become today's background. It is always easier to do a calculation when you know what the result is and you're sure that the methods make sense. In February of 1973, the pace picked up and we completed the calculation in a spurt of activity. At almost the same time, Pollitzer finished his calculation and we compared through Sydney our results with satisfying agreement. And this is the result, which is on the poster. And for three colors and three quarks, the beta function is negative and the theory is asymptotically free. For me, the discovery of asymptotic freedom was totally unexpected. And like an atheist who has just received a message from a burning bush, I am, became immediately a true believer in field theory. Field theory was not wrong. Instead, scaling must be explained by an asymptotically free gauge theory of the strong interactions. This is the paper in which the... Uh, discovery was announced, and in which, in addition to the report of asymptotic freedom of Yang-Mills theory, the hypothesis that this could uh, explain scaling, a remark that there would be logarithmic violations of scaling, and most important, the suggestion that the strong force must be based on a color gauge theory the first paragraph reads that non-abelian gauge theories possess the remarkable feature, perhaps unique among renormalizable theories of asymptotically approaching free field theory. And then, we therefore suggest that one look to a non-abelian gauge theory of the strong interactions to explain, provide the explanation for Bjorkane scaling. Now, we had a specific theory in mind, but before I discuss it, let us ask why are non-abelian gauge theories asymptotically free? Today we can understand this in a very physical fashion, although it was not so clear in 1973. Consider again the screening of the vacuum, the screening properties of the vacuum in a, a non-abelian gauge theory. But now from the magnetic point of view, the magnetic screening properties of the vacuum in classical physics all media are diamagnetic because classically all magnets arise from circulating currents. 
And the response of a system to an applied magnetic field is to set up currents that act to decrease the field. That's Lenz's law. However, in quantum mechanics, you can have a phenomena called paramagnetism uh, because of the possibility of the existence of permanent magnets. This is the case in non-abelian gauge theories where the carriers of the force, the gluons, are themselves charged and they carry spin. This is the main difference between non-abelian gauge theories and electromagnetism where the carriers of the force, the photons, the quanta of light are neutral. In non-abelian gauge theories, the quanta of the force, the gluons, change color and are therefore colored themselves. Thus, the gluons are both carriers of the force and matter particles. And since they are spinning and they have spin one, they behave like permanent magnets. And so the medium, the vacuum in QCD is filled with these permanent magnets and when you insert a magnet into that field, they align with the magnet that you've inserted and increase the force at large distance. They anti-screen the force. This is what we call paramagnetism. QCD is asymptotically free because the anti-screening of the gluons overcomes the screening due to the quarks. There can in fact be as, in QCD as many as 16 quarks uh, before we lose asymptotic freedom. In our first paper, we had a specific theory in mind. The dynamics had to be based on non-abelian gauge theories to explain scaling, and since the experiments indicated that the charged constituents of the nucleon were quarks, the gluons had to be flavor neutral. They couldn't couple to flavor, and we were very well aware, of course, of the growing arguments for the color quantum number, thus the gluons could couple to color and all would be well. And thus we proposed one appealing model is based on three triplets of fermions with an SU3 color gauge group to provide the strong interactions. This is QCD. Now the discovery of asymptotic freedom was indeed a eureka kind of moment. Suddenly the fog lifted, everything became clear. I've been asked by reporters whether when we made this discovery we went out had some champagne and celebrated. I said, of course not. We went out and calculated. <laughs> Let me illustrate this with an animated cartoon by my talented daughter, Elisheva. Exploring physics is something like climbing a mountain. You're never really sure how you, you sort of know what the problem is, the top of the mountain, but you're not sure how you're going to get there and get through the pass. So here we are embarking on the journey. If I get this right, we're climbing the mountain. Nothing much is clear. Some place there is a pass through the top. And suddenly we arrive at the summit. Fog lifts. We look out and see before us a valley of potential calculations. In the distance there are still some clouds. We head down the mountain towards the valley, followed immediately by a whole gang of others. <laughs> and there we are, starting to calculate. Now, Callan and I had already analyzed deep and elastic scattering in such asymptotically free theories, which we didn't think existed, and discovered that in such theories, scaling is violated by calculable logarithmic terms. Thus, we were well aware what the forms of the deviations from scaling would be, and we immediately started to calculate those. We also wondered about the problem of how to extract the quarks, why the quarks couldn't be extracted from the hadrons, but at the original paper we were only sure that perturbation theory is not trustworthy with respect to the stability of the symmetric theory or to its particle content. In our second paper, written a few months later, we outlined in much greater detail the structure of asymptotically free gauge theories of the strong interactions and the prediction of scaling violations, and noted that the gauge symmetry, if exact, 
well, and th that the gauge symmetry could be exact, unlike the electroweak theory, which at first sight would appear to be ridiculous, since then you would expect to see both gluons and quarks. However, in asymptotically free theories, we said, the naive expectations might be wrong. There may be little connection between the free theory, free Lagrangian, and uh, the spectrum of states. It may very well be that the infrared behavior, the large distance behavior of, of, in QCD, is so strong so as to suppress all but color singlet states, and that the colored gauge fields and the quarks could be seen at short distances but never produced as real states, which is qualitatively correct. Thus, asymptotic freedom not only explains scaling at short distances, since the charge became small at short distances, but its converse, sometimes now called infrared slavery, the growth of the charge at large distances offered a mechanism for the confinement of quarks inside the nucleon. And here's a little animation of that, where the quarks, when put inside a hadron as viewed at short distances, behave freely. They move around as if there are no strong forces between them. But if you take those quarks and start pulling them apart, at some distance a strong force, much like a rubber band, develops so strong that the forces can never be pulled out of the hadron. Suddenly it was clear that a non-abelian gauge theory later called QCD, was consistent with everything we knew about the strong force. It could encompass all the successful insights into the strong force of the past decades. The flavor symmetries, for example, were immediate consequences of the theory as long as the masses of the light quarks were light. It explained scaling and gave a qualitative hint of confinement. Most amazing, for the point of view of pragmatic physicist was that one could calculate. Since the force became weak, one could trust perturbation theory, many problems could be tackled, and some theorists were immediately convinced and started to calculate. The experimental confirmation developed much more slowly and initially looked rather bad. I remember in the spring of 1974 attending a meeting in Trieste where I met Bert Richter, who was gloating over the fact that the total electron-positron cross-section uh, was increasing with energy. The ratio of that to the, the cross-section of electrons and positrons to hadrons compared to leptons is called R and should approach a constant, certainly in QCD where you can calculate it and it should have been equal to two given that there were only three quarks. It essentially measures the number of quarks. However, Richter showed us data that showed that R was increasing. If you look at the end of this slide, you see that R for a while looked like it was two, which is appropriate to three quarks, but then started increasing. And he was very excited about this increase because it proved that all these ideas, like QCD, were totally wrong. Now, many of us knew that charmed quarks, the fourth kind of quark, had to exist for the consistency of the electroweak theory, and thus many of us thought that since R was increasing, it was probably because charm was being produced. In the fall of that same year, the charmed mesons were much longer lived than anyone had e imagined, except for Appelquist and Pollitzer, who had predicted that, were discovered, looking very much like simple bound states of quarks. This clinched the matter for many theorists and some experimentalists who were converted to QCD. The rest were probably convinced once experiments later on at higher energy began to see quark and then gluon jets. Today, uh, we have precision tests of, it, of the theory these deviations from scaling that we predicted way back then. Confirmation of these only started to come in 75 to 78 and then at a slow pace. This is the running of the coupling, the decrease of the strong force with uh, energy or shorter distance as it was known in 1989. And you see that you can see an effect, but it's not 
totally convincing, whereas today, as a result of an incredible number of very beautiful and hard experiments at different labs, many hundreds of physicists, we have uh, perfect agreement to roughly 1%. This is the world compilation of the running asymptotic freedom of the strong interactions as confirmed by dozens and dozens of different experiments with uh, essentially 1% accuracy. And this is a marvelous slide which shows how the, um, all of the phenomena, the many different kinds of phenomena that one can measure in uh, QCD, and remember that 99.99% of all the stuff that happens in particle accelerators is QCD, uh, can be explained by one single coupling, which is now measured to high accuracy. And nowadays, when you listen to experimentalists talk about their results, they point to their Lego plots and say, here is a quark, here is a gluon. Believing is seeing, seeing is believing. We believe in the physical reality of quarks and gluons because we believe in asymptotic freedom of their interactions at high energies so that we can look at the experimental output and see quarks and gluons. The way we see quarks and gluons indirectly through the effects they have on our measuring instruments coupled with our theoretical understanding of their dynamics is not much different than the way we see electrons. Even the objection that quarks and gluons cannot be real particles because they can never be isolated has been largely dissipated since we now understand that if we were to heat the world to a temperature of a few hundred MeV, hadrons like the proton would melt into a plasma of liberated quarks and gluons. So finally I'm going to end with some implications of asymptotic freedom. The most important implication, of course, is QCD itself with a point-like behavior of quarks at short distance and the strong confining force at large distance. But also it has greatly increased our confidence in quantum field theory. Traditionally, uh, fundamental theories of nature had, had a tendency to break down at short distances, signaling the appearance of new physics at high energy. Before asymptotic freedom, it was expected that any quantum field theory would break down at sufficiently high energy. But in an asymptotically free theory, this is not the case. The decrease of the force means that uh, no new physics need arise at short distances. Furthermore, in QCD, there are no infinities. We need never encounter infinite quantities. The bare charge is finite. Indeed, it vanishes. The only time infinities appear is if we make the mistake of comparing the, the effective charge at finite distances with the vanishing charge at infinitely short distances. Thus, the discovery of asymptotic freedom greatly reassured us of the consistency of quantum field theory, and we're not far from having a rigorous mathematical proof of the existence of QCD, at least if we put QCD into a box to tame the large distance dynamics that produces confinement. And then QCD is a fantastic theory. It has, at first glance, only one parameter, the dimensionless number that specifies the force. If we neglect the quark masses, which is good approximation for ordinary hadrons since the light quarks are so light. But through the dependence of the charge on distance or energy, uh, a dynamical mass scale is produced. One can define the mass scale of QCD to be the energy where the charge equals some value, say one. And then all observables are calculable in terms of this dynamically generated mass scale. It's sometimes claimed that the origin of mass is the Higgs mechanism, responsible for the breaking of electroweak symmetry that otherwise would forbid quark masses. But this is wrong. Most, 99% of the proton mass is due to the kinetic and potential energy of massless gluons and essentially massless quarks, confined by the strong force in the proton. Thus, QCD provides the first example of a complete theory with no adjustable parameters 
and no indication within the theory of a distance scale at which it breaks down. Indeed, were it not for the electroweak interactions and gravity, we might be satisfied with QCD as it stands. It's the best example we possess of a perfect, complete theory. Furthermore, one can extrapolate QCD indeed to infinitely high energies, and that helps in extrapolating the history of the universe. The universe, expanding since its birth, uh, was originally very hot and dense, and to go back to its early history, one has to know the dynamics that pertains at high energies. Before the standard model, we couldn't go back farther than 200,000 years or so. But now, especially since QCD simplifies at high energies, we can extrapolate to very early times where nucleons melt and quarks and gluons are liberated to form a plasma. And finally, one of the most important applications of asymptotic freedom is the insight it gave into the unification of all the forces of nature. Almost immediately after the discovery of asymptotic freedom and the proposal of QCD, the first attempts were made to unify all the forces, which was natural since one was using very similar theories to describe all of them. And the apparently insurmountable barrier to unification namely the fact that the strong interactions were so much stronger than the others, was seen to be a low-energy phenomena. Since the strong force decreases with increasing energy, perhaps all the forces could have a common origin at very high energy. And George I, Quinn, and Weinberg showed that if one extrapolates our, the knowledge back then, uh, they in fact unite at about 10 to the 14 to 16 GV close to the point, incidentally, where gravity becomes important. This remains our most direct clue as to where the next threshold of fundamental physics lies and hints that at this immense energy all the forces of nature, including gravity, are unified. In more recent times the extrapolation has greatly improved due to the beautiful measurements of many experimenters and the hard work done by many theorists. And now all the forces meet only if we hypothesize a totally new space-time symmetry called supersymmetry, and if this symmetry is broken at reasonably low energies. Increasing hopes that a new superworld will soon be discovered at the LHC accelerator, soon to be completed at CERN. As I end, I would like to thank not only the Nobel Foundation, but nature herself, who has given us the opportunity to explore her secrets and the fortune to have revealed one of her most mysterious and beautiful secrets, the strong force. Thank you.